What you're about to see is the conclusion to a conversation I had last week with philosopher John Tilson, where we talked about Plato's classic in the philosophy of education, the dialogue Meno. And Meno is a fictitious discussion between Socrates and a character named Meno in an attempt to answer the question of whether and to what degree virtue is something that is taught versus something that is innate or inborn. So part one of our conversation, John and I evaluate Socrates and Meno's discussion about whether we need to identify what virtue is before we can even ask a question like whether it can be taught. The second part of our conversation evaluated Meno and Socrates' discussion about whether or not virtue is something that is innate. Is it something that we're born with or is it something that we learn over time? And part three, the part you're gonna watch now, is our evaluation of the discussion between Socrates and Meno discussing whether or not virtue is actually something that is learned and specifically whether it's something that is taught to us rather than something that we're born with. We also go over a few other things like what does it actually mean to teach something? Can learning happen without teaching, etc.? And then we conclude with a general discussion about whether or not uh, Socrates is what we might know today as a troll. So the conversation uh, is fairly wide ranging in this third section, so I hope you enjoy it. Well, let's uh, go on then to the last prong of their argument. So they reject the idea that um, that virtue is necessarily innate, although they give that kind of weird idea that, well, you can have a soul that has eternal, you know, stuff in it, eternal truths, but it can't be all innate at least because in order to exercise virtue, you have to exercise wisdom and wisdom has to be taught. Um, yeah. So then they say, well, virtue doesn't seem like it was taught either um, because first of all, where are all the teachers? Like if virtue is really this teachable thing, um, there's, there's not a lot of people who seem to be able to teach it. Even if they're virtuous people, maybe their children aren't always virtuous. So you're, it's not like they're able to kind of teach this thing. Um, and it's not, doesn't seem like the kind of thing that can be taught explicitly. Like, but my thing here is, my question here is, and the, the concern is that I'm not sure they're using a really way too narrow view of what teaching is. And maybe this goes back to the idea that since Socrates' statements to the slave had question marks at the end, somehow that wasn't Socrates' teaching. Um, it seems like they're really looking for people who use almost explicit, direct, conscious instruction to teach people virtue. And short of that, it must mean that virtue is not teachable. So I guess my question then is, well, can something be taught if it's not direct, explicit, consciously intentional instruction? Are they setting the bar too high for what counts as teaching? Do you, do you know, Kevin, I think that, um, I think that's a very interesting question and we ought to uh, go on to discuss it, but I'm not sure that their arguments are vulnerable to that objection. Okay. Um, so, uh, so one of the arguments they use is, um, you know, Kevin, would you not admit that Bob Geldof is a very virtuous man indeed? And you might say, why, yes, John, there's none more virtuous. And I might say, but consider his daughter, Apple, who is not remotely virtuous. Um, he doesn't have a daughter kind of called Apple. I think he has a daughter called Peach, who is, I'm, I'm sure, wonderfully virtuous. Um, but suppose he's got a daughter called Apple, um, who's, sure. who's not the least bit virtuous. Um, and uh, you know, doesn't he have a daughter called Apple? And has anyone ever said that she's virtuous? No, John, no one's ever said that she's virtuous because she's not. Um, and, then, and then Plato wants to say, well, you know, if virtue were teachable, she would have been taught because Bob would have wanted her to be virtuous and would have made it a priority. Um, and he's taught her all these other things, you know, whether it be didactically or um, any, other, any other kind of teaching that you want. Um, it seems that Apple has failed to be taught. And he sort of go, he goes through this big list of great names of virtuous people who had all the wealth and right. resources at their command and yet failed to bring about virtue in their children. Right. Um, so, well, you know, whatever the, whatever the standard of teaching is, um, he just wants to say that 
you know, manifestly these people have failed to be taught. And right. the fact that they have failed to be taught indicates that it's not teachable and not learnable. Right. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, though, I, I definitely see your point. I'm going to say that I think their objection still is vulnerable to the idea that maybe they're just setting a really high bar. And here's, I have a quote that's kind of along that example. So let's take the example you used about Apple, the, uh, the fictitious but unvirtuous daughter. Um, and Socrates says this uh, about people like that, about the virtuous people whose children are not necessarily virtuous. And you know also that he taught them to be unrivaled horsemen and he had them trained in music and gymnastics and all sorts of arts. In these respects, they were on a level with the best. And he, and he had no wish to make good men of them. Nay, he must have wished it, but virtue, as I suspect, could not be taught. And what I have kind of in brackets in my notes is, uh, when he says, no, virtue probably could not be taught in the way that gymnastics is, in the way that music is. So, right, so Apple may really be great at music. He had music instruction given to her. It was kind of a direct instruction, and she learned it deliberately. And same with gymnastics, there are these principles you can articulate, and uh, like you can teach Apple those things in a direct way. But somehow virtue doesn't look like that. Virtue is not something that can be taught in that way. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's it's almost like... Um, yeah. We're assuming that if he, if the father could not teach Apple directly what virtue was, just like he could with English and math and music, yeah. that therefore virtue, maybe maybe they're not saying therefore, but they're saying virtue doesn't seem like those things. It doesn't seem like that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, so I, I that's interesting. So I think um, I'm not sure what I think. I think that um, I see. I see. Um, maybe see your response. I think that um, plausibly, even gymnastics and music teaching and literature teaching, all of these, all of these things that one can be taught, can't be taught fully didactically, um, and that a lot of things that are, are going to be present in, in good teaching of these things is modeling, where people see the model, see the thing modeled, and then attempt to recreate it, and then maybe have their, their flaws pointed out. Um, mm. But this seems to be the sort of thing that would be done in the case of virtue as well. Um, so I, I guess I guess I'm suggesting that um, uh, within horse riding and other things that one can learn, one won't just be learning them by um, being taught in a highly didactic way. And indeed, indeed, one could perhaps uh, learn horse riding, you know, with, with the minimal sort of instruction possible, mainly through having an exemplar that one copies and where one fails, one sort of realizes one has failed. Or has it pointed out that one has failed? Um, but this um, would, would be the sort of learning that would happen with most sort of practical skills, right? Practical knowledge, and um, would would you know be similar in the case of um, virtue, right? Um, yeah, it's. What, I mean, it's still. What do you think? It's well. It still strikes me that I, you're definitely correct that a lot of those skills, music, um, horse riding, involve a whole lot of practical knowledge that would in some ways have to be gotten by kind of uh, observing other people, having it modeled and things like that. But there's still, I mean, most of those things are still taught in an explicit way of, okay, we're going to learn music now. Like we're going to do music now. We're, we're going to do horseback riding now. So even then it's, 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 um, it seems like what they, what, what Socrates may have in mind is, well, no one sits down and teaches virtue in the same way that you have kind of music tutoring and horseback riding tutoring. Like maybe it's, uh, I mean, I, I guess I still want to say, but virtue, that doesn't mean that virtue isn't taught. It just means that virtue isn't taught deliberately. And okay. it might mean that you're not modeling off of one expert person like you would with music because you have a music tutor. And so I, I still feel like what they want is something or what, they're discounting the idea that it can be taught because they they have a really firm idea in mind of what they mean by taught. Taught must be explicit. It must be intentional. Um, 
and I think it seems like their argument is still, but virtue doesn't seem like it's taught in that way. I'm not sure that means it's not taught, though. Yeah, so I guess I guess they want to say that it's just not taught at all. Um, so however, however um, you understand, uh, whatever you understand teaching to be, you know, the, the parents who would have taught these people have manifestly failed to teach them. And the only reason that they would have failed to teach them is that it's impossible because there's no want of, you know, desire to. And if anyone could, then they could. Um, right. But they, as it turns out, couldn't. Therefore, no one could. Is, is the right. Sort of right. Right. Um, I get that. I mean, I, I'm inclined to say in response to that, well, you can lead a horse to water, but it won't, can't make a drink. So right. maybe you could do everything you can to try and teach virtue, but unless they're a willing recipient, um, it's not going to happen. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he, he, you know, he, li he lists all these, um, you know, these uh, sons of great men, um, very virtuous men who have just failed to learn their father's uh, virtue. Um, one, one wonders whether whether it really follows from a big list that you know it's impossible for them to to learn uh, from their fathers. Um, but, you know the yeah. the premise: if anyone uh, could have taught um, their sons virtue, then these people could have taught their sons virtue. But it seems there needs to be on the other side of that. If anyone would have learned um, from their father's virtue, then these right. sons would have learned from their father's virtue. I wonder but how much of maybe I that's wonder, a open dispute. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder how much of that. Now that I'm listening to you think about this, I wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that, uh, let's say, music or horseback riding. There's a lot of practical knowledge, but you could potentially boil most of the practical knowledge, not all, I'm sure, but most, down to articulable uh, statements. Um, you know, uh, what you know, what are you doing when you play this? You could describe it. You could describe why you're playing something the way you're playing it. Or you could describe why you read this note as a C rather than an E. Or you could describe why you hold, have your legs a certain way when you're horseback riding. Virtue doesn't seem like it's, well, you can boil it down to those articulable things. Like, why are you exhibiting liberality um like how do you know how to exhibit liberality in any situation i don't know that you could really boil it down that way so i wonder if part of their reticence to say virtue can be taught is the idea that those things can't be boiled down to articulable propositions like a lot of music can you know i, I went to a music college for instance i mean we learned improvisation over jazz which you can't really teach and learn in an articulable way but we still had a lot of classes where there was completely direct instruction. You can learn harmony. You can learn theory. You can learn how to play your instrument, you, you know, whereas virtue doesn't seem like that. It seems like it's really not articulable. Um, now, that's that might be where you and uh, Socrates would part ways, because I think that um, in Socrates's case, well, at least he seems committed to the idea that there is some kind of articulable essence to virtue that can be discovered. Um, it's just that he hasn't discovered it. Right. Um, you know, and, and maybe that the hardness to the hardness of working out what the essence of virtue is makes it somewhat difficult to teach it. Um, so perhaps there is something. See, I'm not um, sure. If, would we part? I, would we part ways, or would we actually? Would we agree on that though? Because it sounds like that's his trouble. Is that virtue? <laughs> like we know what this thing we, we don't know how to teach this thing because it's we haven't gotten to figure out what it is yet like we know what music is we know how to teach it so I, like i guess i'm saying is is the divide between the, them thinking music can be taught and virtue not being able to be taught is that because they're having trouble figuring out yeah what exactly no, that's interesting yeah yeah um and uh, that may it may be as a matter of fact that people do have a have trouble teaching virtue because it's not clear what this thing is that they're teaching. Um, now that seems to be bracketed when when um, uh, you've got Socrates who's willing to admit that such and such a person is virtuous. He seems to have been able to identify it. Right. Um, uh, so that shouldn't shouldn't be uh, too much of a problem. Um, but this was all supposed to be an argument about 
whether or not virtue can be taught, whether or not, not whether or not it right. tends to be taught. Like in um, theory, could it be taught? If we knew what this thing was, could it be taught? And, yeah. Right. And it's, it's true that his arguments only speak to whether it is taught at the moment, um, because it's about, you know, what sons in fact are taught by their fathers and what teachers in fact do claim to be able to teach. Um, yeah, so it, it, it seems that the, the arguments really only speak to whether or not virtue is taught rather than whether or not it can be taught. Right. Um, whereas what you're suggesting is that, you know, until we know what virtue is. Which is kind of, it's kind of the opposite of what we concluded in some ways in the beginning. We were saying, well, okay, maybe we don't need to define it. Well, I, maybe you do. Um, I don't know. So, well, at any rate, I mean, they kind of, kind of give up towards the end and say, well, it must be something that comes from God because it's not either innate or it's not learned. So therefore, it, since we don't know, um, therefore it must be something from God, which is always, in my view, kind of the ultimate shrug of the shoulders. Uh, it's not I, the answer. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to say something um, by way of defense, or at least, you know, I don't think it's completely ridiculous in this case. I think it was rather... I thought it was a nice move so that when, when I was looking at the um when I was reading uh how this argument unfolded, my my kind of thought was nice. Um because it, it, it plays out like this. It goes, um, look, either what you know is constitutional, it's in some way a part of you, or it's learned. It goes with these two. And here learned is includes remembering by having questions to elicit it. If you don't need questions to elicit it and it's just part of your composition, let's say, you know, then, then it's um by nature. Right. If you do, then it's learned right. or remembered. He doesn't want to quibble about names. But then he goes, um, and he's, he's starting with the premise that um, whatever virtue is, it has to be profitable. And he's asking whether or not um, we um, sort of says, okay, let's assume that um, it is knowledge. Um, either it's innate in this way or it's learned and he rules out both of those um, and then it's, it looks like well if it's knowledge it can't be can't be innate and it can't be um, learned so um, maybe it's not knowledge mm. and he's got this 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 other idea he says well look you don't need to know um, something in order to have a true opinion so, for instance, you know, I can have the true opinion that my mum is wearing a hat in London right now. I've just made that up. I mean, I've got literally no reason to think that. Um, but suppose it were true. And someone said, "Who? which one's your mum? And I said, she's the one in the hat on the phone. Um, someone's looking at my mum. Which one's your mum? She's the one in the hat. Um, now I'm going to give them a good piece of guidance for identifying my mum. So that true opinion, which is not knowledge, that sort of luckily true opinion, is every bit as useful as knowledge that my mum is wearing a hat. So he kind of goes, all right, so these people don't know, um, uh, these virtuous people, they don't have knowledge, but what they might have is true opinion. And true opinion is every bit as good as knowledge in terms of its usefulness and its applicability. If you're just luckily right all the time, um, good, good for you. I mean, why do you need knowledge? What's the what extra benefit does knowledge bring in addition to the truth of your opinions? Okay. Um, and then, he, but then you kind of need an explanation of where, how you're getting lucky all the time. You know, why is it that someone right. is always getting the right answer, even though they have no reason to think that these are the right answers? Um, and here, he needs to appeal to some kind of you know, it makes sense to appeal. Um, inference to the best explanation might be that there's some kind of uh, deity that's making you come to the right decision all the time. Right. Um, you know, perhaps there's kind of some kind of cosmic luck or something like that, or perhaps there's some kind of epistemic karma. Um, I don't, really don't know. Um, but I, at least parts of it were, were quite sophisticated in terms of um, the way the argument goes. 
Okay. Well, I think, um, I mean, there's been a lot to talk about in this debate or in this dialogue, but at the end, they kind of just, uh, with, and with a lot of Plato's dialogues, they, um, they go through a lot of ground and they don't really conclude anywhere in particular other than, you know, the thing that must be God. So, uh, but I, I think uh, unless you have anything to add, I think we're probably at a good point where we, we've probably gone over every element of this. I, I'd say there's one last element that we might touch on. Yeah, sure. Um, that's this question. I don't know what you, what you think of it, but um, is Socrates a troll? <laughs> I've always thought Socrates was a troll. I've never bought into the whole Socratic dialogue thing. Um, no. Some, Socrates somehow, I like what you were saying, Kevin. <laughs> I've, I've never bought into it. No, because, you know, Socrates is kind of brought up as his paragon of the guy who doesn't know stuff and he's very vocal about what he doesn't know but the thing about his dialogues i mean he he lays traps for people he pushes them in a direction and then he he always seems to be a few steps ahead to say i'm going to push you over this way he's like a lawyer almost whose job it is to catch the their interlocutor in this thing that they can't retract um and, and then kind of get them there and then switch them over here no i mean there's what he does really well is he convinces people who think they know that maybe they don't know but what he doesn't do as well as he claims is not know himself. Because um, he, knows, he <clears throat> knows what directions won't pan out. And he tries to lead you there and then say, see, this doesn't pan out. Whether that's a troll or not, I don't know. Um, what do you, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think what's quite funny is um, the little bit of bitchiness that comes through in Socrates is arguing, um, so that, so that, so um, Mino says at one point, "You remind me of a torpedo fish, Socrates, whatever the hell that is, um, because you torpify the victims and leave them confused." And Socrates is like, "I know why you're making an analogy about me. It's because you want me to make an analogy about you." Young men always want people to make analogies about them. Or a little bit later on, um, Socrates is saying, so let's talk about what virtue is. And uh, Mino says, no, I want to talk about um, whether or not we can learn virtue. And Socrates is like, oh, you, you unruly thing. All right, we'll go along with what you want to talk about and we'll just leave what I want to talk about behind. Yeah, you know, it doesn't do it without uh, commenting, and in some way, a kind of personal comment. Yeah, um, yeah. he gets on Ant Antinous. Uh, we didn't we didn't mention him as a further character in it. Um, yeah, who yeah. Who, um, who who sort of says, "Look, stop bad mouthing everyone in the uh, in in Athens, Socrates." It sounds like you're having a bitch about everyone in in uh, Athens, um, and and Socrates' rep reply is, "Ah." Oh, he thinks I'm defaming him. He doesn't know what defamation is. And when he does, he'll apologize to me. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Definitely. Yeah, he does get pretty um, bothered in, in this dialogue. It's, it's, um, I, I haven't read enough of Plato's dialogues to know whether he gets bo that bothered in other dialogues, but he really doesn't like, um, for a guy who doesn't know stuff, he does not like being challenged. He, he, he has an agenda. He, he wants to go here. And if you challenge him um, in a way where he can't answer, I mean, he's okay challenging other people, like the torp he torpifies, but if he was torpified himself, I think that's usually, if you look, that's where he gets angry. He, uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's, that's a good question, though. Uh, would we consider him a troll? Yeah, maybe, maybe so. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, all right. Well, I, I think that uh, probably concludes our, uh, our our dialogue on the dialogue of Meno. Um, like most philosophers, I don't think they uh, <laughs> we really got anywhere concrete in terms of positive uh, positive statements about whether virtue can be taught. But it's it's certainly interesting to think about, and others will obviously draw their own conclusions. So, um, uh, John, it's been it's been good talking with you, and I look forward to our next conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure and I can't wait to wait for the next one.